Coming up on Sue Does America, Chris Cuomo has more in common with his trashy brother Andrew than we originally thought. I'll give you the gross details. And one of my favorite books I've read recently is Chaos Under Heaven, Trump, Xi, and the Battle for the 21st Century. China's such an important issue right now. So I'm extremely excited to welcome the author to the program for an extended interview tonight, as we do, Josh Rogan. country has faced some pretty big challenges over the years. I don't know if you've noticed this. Uh, its founding was kind of a challenge back at the very beginning. Nazis were quite the challenge. Soviet Union, pretty big challenge. Islamic extremism, still a big challenge. But we are entering a new era where China is the new challenge. Obviously, we've recognized China is not our friend for a long, long time. However, under President Xi, China has adopted a new aggressive stance and tone. Now, there are some in our government that have recognized that threat, but there are far too few that have understood the real threat that China is. Josh Rogan is someone who does understand that threat. He writes for the Washington Post and has a new book called Chaos Under Heaven that is out now. You can get it wherever books are sold. We're going to be talking to him in a minute about everything from the naive understanding of the Obama administration when it comes to China, to the various warring factions within the Trump administration, to the extensive efforts by the CCP to influence America and its policies, its politicians, and even its students. And we'll delve into the origins and cover up of COVID-19, including information that indicates dangerous research was going on in Wuhan long before any of us had ever heard of COVID-19. So where do we go from here? Can we maintain an economic relationship with China at all? Can we stop the rise of the CCP? What are the stakes and what are the rules of engagement? Let me quote Josh Rogan from Chaos Under Heaven. The CCP under Xi sees itself as being locked in an existential, ideological and political struggle with the West. Some may argue that America and its allies should avoid casting the U.S.-China competition as a battle between ideologies. But that ship has sailed. Xi is waging an ideological battle, and the West can either engage in it or lose it. We talk to Josh Rogan next. So do you like having a big old snack sometime in the afternoon? Maybe some cheese fries, disco fries? Isn't disco fries the ones with cheese on top and then they put gravy on top of that? Who invented those things? Someone who was high. Uh, but Bilt Bar is here to solve those problems of an afternoon craving without blowing up your entire diet for a month. Um, they have all sorts of great fly, uh, flavors, great delicious sweet flavors. Coconut, coconut's like a, almost like a mounds type of vibe. Mint brownie, uh, double, double chocolate, salted caramel, cookies and cream, tons of flavors. They have nine normal flavors they have uh, all the time. You can get a mixed box that gives you two of each, which is a great way to start out with Bilt Bar. They have 18 grams of protein and 180 calories or less. Only four to five grams of sugar, four to five net, net carbs. You wouldn't know that by tasting them though, because uh, they taste good. They're not like protein bars. They taste good. They're like candy bars that happen to be healthy. Built.com is the place to go to get these things. You're going to love them. Built.com. The promo code is STU15. You will save 15% off your first order. Use the promo code STU15 for 15% off at Built.com because that's how they know you like this stupid show. Built.com. Promo code STU15 for 15% off. I'm happy to welcome Josh Rogan back to the program. He's a columnist for The Washington Post and author of Chaos Under Heaven, Trump, G, and the Battle for the 21st Century. Josh, thanks for coming back on. Great to be with you again. Yeah, it's, it's great. We, we've had you on before talking kind of about the news of the day, and it was honestly before I was able to dive into the book, which I recently was able to finish. It's a great piece of, uh, of, of reporting, and honestly, something that I think everybody who cares about the U.S.-China relationship really needs uh, to, to read for themselves. Well, thanks so much. You know, I've been covering U.S.-China relations since about 
2004 and waiting for the rest of the world to see that this is going to be the most important issue in foreign policy and really the most important bilateral bilateral relationship in the world for as far as the eye can see. So that's what the book was about. It's about to sort of bring everybody to a base understanding of the nature of the threat that we're facing and how uh, it's all uh, connected to uh, various parts of our uh, society and, our, and should be connected to various parts of our response. Bring me back to 2004 for a second, because that's when you start as a journalist. And the first story you really are ever involved in involves China and Sudan. Can you can you walk us through it? Yeah, well, I fell uh, uh, ass backwards into journalism uh, <laughs> while I was working at a law firm in Philadelphia and applying for law school. And I was working on a case related to uh, the, the people of South Sudan, what was then Southern Sudan, now South Sudan, uh, who were victims of genocide. And what I found in my research for that lawsuit was that China was complicit in even perpetrating that genocide through a corrupt oil deal with the Sudanese regime. And, you know, when I saw those documents back in 2004, now we think of Chinese uh, mischief in Africa as pretty routine. But back then, evidence was hard to find. And I ended up uh, co-authoring an op-ed in the Straits Times of Singapore with uh, a, a local a China scholar in DC about these documents about China's actions in Sudan and uh, uh, basically I almost got fired from my paralegal job because they didn't want the paralegal writing op-eds and uh, then I got hired to be a, a Pentagon reporter for the Asahi Shinbun the J- daily Japanese newspaper in their Washington bureau and just like that I was off to the races covering the Pentagon uh, for one of the largest news organizations in the world and uh, you know it was because I had uh, I found this story about uh, uh, China's uh, comprehensive sort of diplomatic, military, economic uh, um, uh, coercion and bribery and, and malfeasance in Africa that the editors at that Japanese newspaper hired me. And I followed the story ever since. Yeah, I mean, comprehensive is a really good uh, word for what uh, what China is doing. You paint this picture throughout. I, and I, I honestly, it was overwhelming at times uh, how much is going on and the things that they're trying to do in this country. I want to go into like the, the, the influence operations that they seem to be running all over the place, um, going from uh, targeting younger politicians. <laughs> this story was amazing. Let me give you this. This is from Chaos Under Heaven. Neil Bush was always quite supportive of China when talking to the press, and he was often quoted in Chinese state propaganda outlets. There are also troubling indications that China may hold a, coerci- a cold coercive leverage over the younger Bush. In a 2003 deposition for his divorce, Neil Bush admitted having sex with several women in, in Thailand and Hong Kong who showed up at his door unannounced in hotels during business trips. This is what is commonly referred to as a honey trap, where sex is used to compromise targets who are usually being surveilled. Mr. Bush, you have to admit, it's a pretty remarkable thing for a man to just go to a hotel room door and open it and have a woman standing there and have sex with her. His wife's lawyer said, it was very unusual, Bush replied. Uh, You have example after example of this type of stuff going on where it's not targeting the most powerful people, it's targeting people who are young and up and coming to try to get influence later on. Well, that's right. I mean, we often think about the U.S.-China relationship as a series of headlines between presidents and lawmakers and secretaries of state. Uh, But what the book tried to explain is how that's all connected, especially on the Chinese side, to what they have built, which is a massive influence operation, under the rubric of what they call the United Front. And this involves hundreds of front organizations and proxies all over the world, actually, uh, that are funneling billions and billions of dollars into foreign institutions. It's not quite propaganda, soft power. It's not quite spying and covert. It's something in between. It's a, it's a hybrid. It's, you know, overt actions that conceal a covert purpose. And, you know, one of the main ways that they do this is by building relationships over time with famous people or people who are related to famous people on both sides of the aisle. And they do it systematically. And basically what they do is they just throw tons of money and uh, in Hunter Biden's case, diamonds, and in Neil Bush's case, uh, prostitutes at him, uh, you know, to see which ones they'll take, you know, and they don't just do it to sons of presidents and vice presidents. They do it to small town mayors uh, who may become congressmen someday, may sit on the intelligence community someday. And this is how they do. And so, you know, we can look at each one of these incidents and be like, oh, that's that's crazy. You know, how can uh, the sons of, of presidents and vice presidents not realize uh, that they're being offered all of these enticements, money, diamonds and prostitutes with some agenda on the side of the person offering them? Uh, but, you know, what, what I tried to explain in the book is that it's not just these incidents. It's all tied together into a 
their real plan, which is to sort of, uh, to, first of all, st- uh, snuff out any criticism of the Chinese Communist Party and its actions. Second of all, to advance the Chinese Communist Party's interests and agenda in our society. And third of all, to erode the uh, integrity of our society by destroying the antibodies of our democracy, by eroding our the integrity in our of our institutions. And that's not just politicians, that's businessmen, that's our schools, that's our tech companies, our Wall Street firms, our Hollywood um, uh, theaters, and of course our sports, as we saw with the NBA example. The Chinese Communist Party won't be happy until there's not uh, any institution in America or the world uh, that uh, isn't compromised enough to shut up about its atrocities. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's complicated because, of course, Neil Bush, uh, you know, runs something called the George H.W. Bush Center for U.S.-China Relations, which is funded by uh, a man by the name of Tung Chi Hua, who's a Hong Kong billionaire who sits atop the influence organization structure for the CCP. He's the vice chairman of one of their major influence organizations. And if you just think about that for a second, you're like, wait a second, the George H.W. Bush Center for China Relations is funded by the Chinese Communist Party's influence operation. It's all run by George H.W. Bush's wayward son. That's a pretty crazy and messed up scenario, but that's only one of hundreds. I mean, I, I got to a few of them in the book, but there are hundreds more. Yeah, I, that was one of the, the, the thing that kept slapping me in the face over and over again as I'm, uh, as I'm reading your book is how far behind we feel. Like, it, it feels as if they are constantly playing the long game and there's so many different efforts going on at the same time. Let me give you this. This is uh, from Chaos Under Heaven as well, um, about the Confucius Institutes here in the United States. By inviting Confucius Institutes onto their campuses, in short, American academic administrators have allowed a generation of U.S. university students to be taught as their primary source of information on China the regime's official version of its history, ideology, and policies. How on earth did this happen, Josh? You know, again, over time, systematically, while we were sleeping. And what the Chinese Communist Party did, and again, this came from the part of the party that does the propaganda, that does the influence operations. It's not hard to figure out if you understand how their system works. Uh, They built hundreds, hundreds of uh, their own cultural centers inside foreign universities. They had over 100 of them inside uh, the United States uh, in public and private universities all over the country until a couple of years ago when people started to wake up to that. And, you know, what the... Confucius Institutes are ostensibly are places where you can go and learn some Chinese language and culture. And, you know, in many cases, they were totally benign, but in certain cases, they weren't. And there, it, what, I de- what I started to look into this, what I found was there were tons of examples of where these Confucius Institutes and other Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, uh, proxies on campus, like uh, student associations, etc., cetera, uh, snuffed out academic freedom on U.S. campuses, spied on uh, Chinese students while they were trying to breathe the air of free speech on our soil, uh, and became a, a place where the Chinese Communist Party put intelligence collectors in some cases, in some cases where they just tried to steer the curriculum away from things that were critical of China, prevent the Dalai Lama from coming to campus, you name it, right? And, you know, it's If we think back, we're like, oh, yeah, maybe it wasn't a good idea to let all of our public and private uh, higher education on China be funded by the Chinese Communist Party, because that seems crazy now. But it was we didn't realize until there were over 100 of these things embedded in these campuses. And they all come with some level of corruption because, you know, that once you take the money and then you get your access in China, then you get a flow of Chinese students paying full freight at your university. Now your academics can go to China and get meetings. And that's how they rope you in. And it's not all 100 percent bad. It's not all 100 percent good. It just means that if they can convince these schools to give up a little bit of their independence and a little bit of their integrity uh, and they do it a a couple hundred times, eventually they're going to get closer to what they want. Uh, What's funny is that, you know, uh, when the the Defense Department went around and started to realize that uh, that a lot of these Confucius Institutes were actually co-mingled with Pentagon programs to teach Chinese to college students. And that was a total corruption of of the of the system. Uh, They basically told all these universities that they had to choose. 
between it, do you want Pentagon Chinese language funding or do you want Chinese Communist Party language funding? And of course, all the American universities chose the Pentagon programs and a bunch of Confucius Institutes shut down. Uh, still, there's no transparency and there's no visibility into many of these contracts and many of the relationships, which include just millions and millions of dollars changing hands in ways that can't be good for our democracy. And I believe the number in the book is there's still 60 of these around right now in U.S. colleges. These things still exist. Not As you mentioned, not all bad, but still, it's, it's incredible and hard to believe. Uh, one of the things um, going through the influence operations I thought was interesting, you mentioned the NBA. And kind of everyone was familiar with this NBA example with Daryl Morey and, and, and LeBron James and how that all went down. And people are familiar with like the, the, the way Hollywood is influenced by you know, Chinese money and the culture is influenced in that way. But I was, I, was, I was shocked by not only how big China seemed to go, but also how small. Uh, this story I had never heard. It's amazing. Uh, Marriott even fired an American worker for liking a tweet by a pro-Tibet group. That employee, Roy Jones, didn't even remember liking the tweet while working the overnight shift at the Omaha, Nebraska branch of the Marriott Technical Support Operation after Chinese authorities shut down Marriott's website in China and started a criminal investigation. The company fired Jones from his $14 an hour job and then the president of their Asia division apologized profusely to the Chinese press. There, this isn't just some one-off situation. They're looking to intimidate U.S. countries to control our culture and our economy. Well, that's right. It's it's a, first of all, it's a matter of free speech. You know, uh, it's one thing for the Chinese government to snuff out free speech inside of its own borders, and that's terrible. And we need to stand against that publicly uh, whenever we see that kind of repression in a foreign country. But it's a, a whole other thing when they try to stamp out free speech inside of our country, and when they tell Americans that we can't tweet something that we want to tweet uh, on in our on our own soil. I mean, that's crazy. It's it's a, basically their attempt to expand what they've built in China, which is a social credit system. And, you know, people will say, people who defend the CCP will say, oh, well, we have credit system, don't we? If you apply for a loan, you they check your credit. But that's different because that's based on actual economic and legal rules. And the Chinese social credit system is based on allegiance to the party state, to Xi Jinping himself, to an ideology, to a, their particular uh, brand of uh, repression and autocracy. And if you just think about that, well, if we allow that to happen, that means that there'll be nobody allowed to criticize anything in, about China ever in America without huge repercussions for their company, the entire industry. I mean, one tweet by Daryl Morey cost the NBA something on the order of $400 million for one tweet. You know, that's a you have to be pretty paranoid and insecure to punish the entire NBA and deny American companies and Chinese companies that all of those profits over one tweet. It's 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 ridiculous. It's Orwellian, but it's also, you know, it, insane. So, you know, the problem, of course, is that when all of these organizations get into this, these binds, uh, when the when the Chinese Communist Party comes to punish them, uh, they don't know what to do. Right. And they are not powerful enough to stand up to the Chinese Communist Party by themselves. So they all do the same thing, which is to kowtow and to bow and scrape, beg for forgiveness and pay a penance and try to keep their market access inside China. But what I say in the book is that, hey, uh, you know, actually, we should come together on this thing and find a way for the government and the private sector to work together to push back against this kind of censorship, this kind of uh, exportation of Chinese repression into our society, into our institutions. And, uh, you know, I think the Trump administration started to try to do that. It didn't really go very well. Most uh, companies and, you know, schools and tech companies and Wall Street firms don't like it when the FBI or the White House comes and knocking and says, hey, you've got to do this or you've got to do that. But more and more American corporations are realizing that this is all going in one direction because the Chinese Communist Party is actually getting worse based on everything we see there. The crackdown on their ride sharing, their tutoring, their real estate market, their uh, Hollywood films, you name it, their financial markets. Uh, they're they're taking the great leap backward. And, you know, any company that's doing business in China is going to have to contend with that. And, you know, all I would say is that, you know, unless these ch companies realize that in the long term, uh, their interest really is in standing up for free speech, especially for Americans and not caving to Chinese Communist Party intimidation and pressure. Uh, if they could realize that and then if we could offer them a way to push back, I think that would be a start. But that's not really happening right now because our government and our society is not 
uh, operate in that like, sort of sophisticated level of discourse, at least at the moment. It seems like we're just completely unprepared for the threat that we are trying to deal with. I want to get into how the U.S. Uh, government has been dealing with uh, China over the past couple decades. Um, and also we're going to go into uh, the, the, the response to coronavirus and the origins as well. We'll be back with Josh Rogan in just a second. Back with Washington Post columnist and author Josh Rogan. The book is Chaos Under Heaven, Trump, Xi, and the Battle for the 21st Century. There's so much about the Trump administration in this book. I want to get to that here in a second. But I want to go backwards to the Obama administration first. Josh writes, in order for the Obama team to, to claim a successful China policy, it needed to portray the relationship as copacetic, a need that manifested itself as willful blindness to the changing reality. Toward the end of its tenure, indeed, the Obama White House went to great lengths to avoid disrupting relations with China. Susan Rice, is the National Security Council, went so far as to directly instruct the Pentagon officials not to use the term competition when referring to the U.S.-China relations and find a less inflammatory term. Their deference was not rewarded with respect. Uh, that, you know, I, to me, the, part, the parts in your book about the Obama administration showed a complete disconnect to what the reality of the situation was. And, you know, I, I, I was not a fan of Obama as president, and so I wasn't completely stunned by this, but it really was a little bit shocking that there was no real realism behind their efforts at all. Right. There were people at the end of the Obama administration who were noticing that uh, ever since at least 2013 that China was changing, that the broad bet that we had made that engaging China would cause it to liberalize economically and then in turn liberalize politically and that would in turn solve all of our problems uh, wasn't panning out that Xi Jinping was deciding to go a different way. Uh, but even up until the very end of the Obama administration, as you just read out, uh, that those people didn't win the day. And Susan Rice and people like John Kerry prioritized climate change and the Iran deal, and they thought they needed China to be successful in both of those. And, uh, you know, also they thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election so that they could pretty much assure the Chinese leaders that everything was going to be copacetic. And then when Trump came in, he flipped over the chessboard, okay, and everything was all, all on the table and off the table, and uh, everything was reset, and there was a lot of disruption. And then out of that disruption came a lot of uh, good ideas, some bad ideas, some good ideas that weren't fully implemented, and a lot of chaos. That's why the book's called Chaos and he Under Heaven. But overall, what you had was a, a reorientation of U.S. foreign policy towards the idea that, hey, wait a second, engagement is not working, that actually the Chinese Communist Party is weaponizing our engagement against us and using our help to build the machine that's pointed at us. And uh, we ought to rethink that and be clear eyed about that. And then we ought to mount some sort of new strategic response. And, you know, that's what the Trump administration did. They tried to mount that response, albeit imperfectly. And they, of course, they ran out of time, too. And there were uh, the Chinese had their own uh, uh, moves to make. Uh, but now what we see in the Biden administration is something in between. Right. In some ways, they're considering the they'll say the word competition. Sure. Uh, but we also see this idea that we have to have smooth relations with China in order to get them to do things that we want. And we saw, we saw that this week when, uh, you know, right now the Chinese, the U.S. Justice Department is about to release the Huawei CFO, who we just spent three years trying to uh, uh, extradite, and they're just going to give up on that. Uh, they've softened their language on Hong Kong. Uh, there have been other concessions. And basically what we're seeing is an attempt by some people in the Biden administration uh, to improve the relationship because they think that will get Xi Jinping to act better. But what the record shows, and I think what my book argues pretty clearly, is that uh, no, actually, the Chinese Communist Party is <clears throat> changing for the worse because that's what that's the direction that they're trying to go down. In other words, the mm. Great Leap Backward in China is intentional and in that they're not looking to repair relations with the United States as their first priority. They're looking to consolidate power internally and externally, and that comes at our expense. And, you know, if you just look at the their actions during the pandemic, and I know we're about to get into that, uh, that should tell you all you need to know about what uh, uh, China as a superpower looks like and what that means for us and for the world. It's, it's not a pretty picture. 
Yeah, it really is. Let me let me go to um, let me go to the Trump administration a little bit. You spent a, a good amount of time on the Trump administration, and it's it's interesting to look at the internal dynamics of that administration. Um, there are you do you kind of outline four different groups that are sort of at battle on how to deal with China from the very beginning um, uh, when Trump becomes president. Can you kind of tell us? Uh, can you kind of walk us through these groups? Because I think it's they're <laughs> important characters in the story. Sure. Well, remember that uh, President Trump campaigned on resetting the U.S.-China relationship. That was one of his main uh, platform planks, and uh, it, um, I'm sure it contributed to his victory because people all over the country were calling for that. And, uh, you know, when he was elected immediately, the Chinese government assumed that our China policy would be in the hands of uh, the people from the campaign, Peter Navarro and Stephen Bannon and Steve Miller. And I call them the superhawks. They're the people who wanted to bring down the Chinese Communist Party as soon as possible and take all uh, the measures available to do so. Uh, and of, what was shocking to many uh, people inside the Trump administration was that once the administration actually started, uh, Trump largely handed the ball over to the Wall Street click. And that was people like uh, Gary Cohn and Steve Mnuchin and later Larry Kudlow. And they wanted to make a deal. And in order to do that, they wanted to let China off the hook for a lot of bad Behaviors, and then there was another group inside the system called the hardliners, and they were people like Matt Pottinger and you know John Bolton and Mike Pompeo, and they were trying to steer the beast from the inside. They they couldn't fight the politics, but they could fight on the bureaucratic level, and they wanted to turn towards a tougher China policy, but not one that would bring down the CCP necessarily. And then there was like this axis of adults, you know, the generals of the Washington poobas who thought that yeah. it was their job to be the guardrails of a republic, but of course that wasn't their job, and they all eventually got. Uh, pushed aside. We're talking about McMaster yeah. and Madison and the like. Mm -hmm. yeah. But in the end, you know, just to finish the thought, you know, the hardliners won not because they were the best tacticians, but because the Chinese Communist Party proved them right. Because over the course of the four years, even everyone, including Steve Mnuchin and Larry Kudlow, and especially President Trump, came to realize that the Chinese Communist Party didn't want to make a good deal, that they weren't interested in solving any of these problems. Then our only choice was to protect ourselves. Yeah, you know, I thought uh, going through the book, one one guy who I thought, one figure that came out, I thought looking really well in the book was Matthew Pottinger. Uh, he seemed to be on the right side of several different issues uh, in tough situations, including um, he was really the first, there was a meeting early on in the, in the COVID situation uh, with Fauci there, uh, with you know all the big figures from the medical uh, from the medical side, and Pottinger was really the only person who said we need to stop travel from China right then. To Trump's credit, he he kind of overruled a bunch of the uh, uh, medical people, including Fauci, at that time, and decided to go ahead with that ban. Only later would they come along for that uh, for that decision. Uh, that was a pretty it was pretty interesting because I think you'd look at Donald Trump and, you know, like a lot of people in my audience really love Trump. Some people don't like him, but like he doesn't come from a background where you think uh, making a decision in that sort of crisis would be his strong suit. Uh, that particular moment, though, he, he looked pretty good. Right. Well, I mean, if you read you've read the book, if you read it out there, uh, you'll see it's not a pro-Trump book. It's not an anti-Trump book. There's a lot of good. There's a lot of bad. There's a lot of ugly. But I do say that the Trump administration got one big thing right. They turned us towards a more competitive policy towards the CCP, which is long overdue. Now, Matt Pottinger was the architect of a lot of that strategy because he spoke Chinese. He could uh, he was a reporter in China during the SARS outbreak. He had sources on the ground. Uh, he had sources uh, in Washington, and he was reading the intelligence. He was, he was the, he sounded the alarm on COVID, and he was shouted down not just by the public health officials, but also the political people like Mick Mulvaney and Steve Mnuchin, uh, who told Trump that he shouldn't ruin the economy in the middle of election by shutting down travel from foreign countries. Now, you know, now we know that, of course, Pottinger was right and M Mick Mulvaney was wrong because the, uh, the pandemic was so bad and because, you know, actually it was Trump's if Trump had been more aggressive, he probably uh, uh, might he might actually have won the election. And actually, the delay that was caused by people who were telling him it was no big deal uh, probably hurt our response. Definitely hurt our response. And the one number one person telling him that it was no big deal was Xi Jinping, and that's exclusively reported in my book. The president of China lied to the president of the United States and told him the coronavirus uh, could be uh, healed with herbal medicine and that warm weather would get rid of it. And you know, Donald Trump to his discredit, believed him and started to uh, say those things in public, not telling the American people that uh, they came from the Chinese president, who we now know is definitely lying to him. But eventually Trump did realize that the Chinese president was lying to him, and he unleashed his 
uh, officials, especially Matt Pottinger, to do a lot of important things on China that remain to this day. So it was really a roller coaster. But in the end, what we learned is that the people who were right were the people who understood the nature of the CCP, which is that it's an increasingly uh, uh, um, paranoid um, uh uh, psychotic, genocidal, expansionist, repressive dictatorship. And, you know, history shows us that history should have warned us that when you face expansionist, repressive, nationalist, socialist, psychotic, di genocidal dictatorships, uh, the they will keep growing and keep advancing until confronted, until someone uh, 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 some or some entity or some country uh, decides to stand up to them. Yeah, you know, I, you, you describe, I think, what maybe is the moment in your book, which is Donald, you know, everyone remembers Trump coming out and saying, like, we think it's going to go away when it warms up in April right. or May. Many people are saying. Many people are saying. And the many right. people was Xi, was President was Xi. Xi Jinping. Yeah, That's which crazy. is crazy. I mean, and, That's and crazy. you know, it's, it's interesting, his relationship with these sort of foreign dictators is such a bizarre part, I think, of his presidency. I mean, you, you know, at times you wonder, at least I wonder from afar as an observer, you know, is it, is it a negotiation tactic? I mean, he said he was going to blow up, you know, Kim Jong-un, and he also said he was his best friend. And at, at the time when coronavirus and COVID is, is, is starting to, to hit in China, we're at a point where he's negotiating this trade deal. And he is kind of promoting that he's a good good friends with Xi. They understand each other. Um, they have this friendship and they can get past these sort of disagreements. And it's in that moment where he's getting these herbal remedies and uh, it's going to go away when it warms up. And you realize how much of that. I mean, was that real? Was he did, was he actually did he believe he was friends with with Xi? What was the truth behind that? You know, I think the bottom line there is that. President Trump saw himself as the CEO, and he sees other world leaders as CEOs of their own corporations. And it, from his time in business, he thought that most deals are made between CEOs and by developing those personal relationships, even if that other CEO is not really a good guy on the face of things. And there's a logic to that, right? It, it's not to say that uh, he didn't make uh, a good argument in saying that, oh, well, we need to have good relations with other leaders, including Kim Jong-un or whoever. Uh, but it didn't work, right? And it, it, it's not because... Uh, you know, uh, uh, of the uh, necessarily because he chose a top down relationship based strategy. It's because of what we just talked about that underneath him, all of his uh, officials were fighting with each other and undermining each other and trying to sabotage each other. Uh, so there was nothing underneath it. It, it. it only that that personal relationship only goes so far. And, you know, I do think that there was a, a reasonable chance that. Uh, you know, that a personal relationship between world leaders could advance the things that we both want. We both want to avoid a conflict. We both want to uh, have trade. We both want to have interactions. We don't No, Neither side wants to enter into a Cold War or even a hot war. Uh, the problem is that uh, Donald Trump got bad advice from at least half of his staff who told him that the Chinese government was not what we what we now know it is. They told him that it was economically driven, but it's not. It's politically driven. They told him that their priority was business, but it's not. Their priority is uh, control. Their priority is their survival of the party state. And as we see now, they just wiped a trillion dollars of value off of their own companies in a month. You know, so apparently they don't really care the most about business. They care about, uh, you know, repressing uh, 1.4 billion people and expanding that influence worldwide. And you know, I think if Trump had been properly staffed, uh, then he might have come out a lot better. And it also happens to be true that. Xi Jinping told him lies and he believed them. And it took him too long to figure out that the Chinese president was not actually uh, his good friend. He should have realized it much earlier. Yeah, I think that's one of the most, I mean, you look at this, one of the most frustrating things is it's one thing for a secretive regime to not give us the truth, to not deal with us honestly. You'd hope in a moment where a global pandemic is in the midst of breaking out from one of their cities and quite possibly one of their labs, that there would be some sort of breakdown of those walls to at least share information and be honest with the information that you do have. We obviously haven't seen that from China. To this day, we still haven't seen it. You have a couple. Well, go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say, actually, we've seen quite the opposite. Yeah. You know, you know while, while we can all, we all have to say that we don't know exactly how the pandemic started, we, should, we, we can't ignore the fact that uh, the cover-up uh, is obvious, and the cover-up is centered around a series of labs in Wuhan. And you know, you would have to think that if this was just some sort of accident, if this was just some sort of natural occurrence, well, there would be no reason for the Chinese government to jail the journalists, jail the scientists, mm. censor all of the science, to 
hold back all of the data to this day, not allow any investigation or really any access to a lab that was built with American and French support that happens to have all the back coronaviruses uh, that next to where the back coronavirus pandemic broke out. And so I think one of the most common sense uh, explanations for why people both inside and outside the government think it might have come from the lab is because that's where the cover up is centered. It's centered on the lab. And then we can get to all the other evidence if you want. But that's, you know, sort of speaks to what you just said. Yeah, let me just give you one piece of it. This is number seven uh, in the control room, guys. Um, th- th- one piece of evidence that like you have several of, of these that are this this level. and I think this revealing. But this is one from a Chinese report buried in the Chinese report was a huge clue that the scientists were hiding information about their past work on the issue. The senior official told uh, Josh, the Beijing scientists had studied some mice that were 30 weeks old at the time that they were infected with COVID, according to the paper. But in order for the mice to be 30 weeks old at the time of the infection, the mouse model the scientists said they created would have had to have been developed months before uh, the coronavirus was ever publicly identified. And this is like, it, there are several right. different examples like this where it's just open and shut that something was going on. Doesn't mean we know for sure that COVID came right. from a, a lab leak, but it does really point in that direction and certainly points to the direction that they were misleading everybody. Right. What you've just read out is one piece of circumstantial evidence, not direct evidence, not proof of circumstantial evidence uh, that the lab might have been connected to the outbreak in some sort of way. And there's a number of ways it could have been connected. Uh, but what I found in the reporting of the book was, was that a lot of people inside the government and the intelligence community uh, were shocked to learn that uh, inside not only this Wuhan Institute of Virology that everyone talks about, but a network, a series of labs in uh, Beijing and Wuhan, including some that involved the uh, People's Liberation Army, there was all of this uh, coronavirus research, including research about how to pass it through mammals back and forth, including I- mice with humanized lung characteristics uh, that they didn't tell us about. And this sort of puts the lie to the uh, the narrative that you've heard from uh, a lot of American scientists, uh, many of whom are have deep conflicts of interest because they were working with the Wuhan labs. And what they'll always say was, is well, we 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 know exactly what they were doing, and uh, yeah, well, we totally believe them when they say they never saw the coronavirus before uh, in the outbreak. And you know, both of those statements are are patently uh, ridiculous because you know what I report in the book and what a lot of people now say. I wrote the book a year. I mean, I filed that a year ago. But if you just think in the last year how much evidence has come out of work going on in all of these Chinese. Uh, 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 coronavirus labs that that they were keeping secret, that they were taking our money, and that not that they uh, that our grants and our, our uh, that our our government d- directly funded the research that uh, resulted in the virus. That's not necessarily what happened. What I'm saying is that we built up a a, a lab program in China, gave them the know-how, which is much more important than the money, and then they took that know-how and built another side of the lab, the side they didn't tell us about, and then they built that. Uh, side in conjunction with the Chinese military. And that's a black box. And we don't know what happened there. And they refuse to tell us. And in order to have any assurance that we've actually checked out this story, that we've actually made any real attempt to figure out how we got into this mess, how this dystopian nightmare that we're all living through started, uh, in order for us to have be able to even say we tried, uh, we're going to need to audit that lab, and and not just that lab, probably a bunch of Chinese labs. And uh, there's no plan for that right now. The Biden administration shows no interest in that, frankly, and they just want to sweep it under the rug and move on. But the problem is that we can't move on. One, because unless we find out how we got into this mess, we don't know what to do to prevent the next one. And that's pretty important unless you want to do this every two years. We're going to have to figure out what happened so we can figure out how to change policy and politics to prevent the next one. And uh Second, because, you know, there's no statute of limitation on 4 million deaths, Mm. you know, 4 million people, 670, 680,000 Americans, you know, every one of those deaths uh, leaves a family behind who's going to want answers and probably they're going to want some justice and some accountability. And they, frankly, they deserve it, you know, and the only organization in the world that's powerful enough to have any chance of giving it to them is the U.S., government. And that's why our failure to pursue this investigation is so shocking and so outrageous, I think. And, you know, there's a few people in Congress working very hard on this, but, you know, without real subpoena power or without a further, you know, uh, diplomatic effort to press the Chinese to actually cooperate with any of the number of investigations that are out there, uh, is a good chance they're going to get away with this. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what kind of lesson is that going to teach the CCP if they can cover up? You know, again, we don't know exactly how it started, but either way, the cover up is real. Yeah. And ongoing. 
and having ongoing harm and causing ongoing suffering to to Americans, to people all over the world. And uh, if we just uh, stand by and let that happen, well, you know, the 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 ways that that will embolden the CCP the next time they uh, 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 there's a crisis uh, are uh, strike me as very scary. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, well put. Um, if you want to really understand. Uh, the Chinese-American relationship, the global uh, conflict that's going on, the competition, as it were, um, and you really want to know more about it than anybody else, any of your friends that you talk to. Uh, also, you want to be completely terrified multiple times. <laughs> you need to get this book, Chaos Under Heaven, Trump, Xi, and the Battle for the 21st Century. Make sure to go out and grab a copy today. You're going to need to know this information because this is all coming. This is not letting up. And the way that the Biden administration is, is looking at this right now, I'm afraid it's going to get worse. Josh Rogan, the book is fantastic. Thanks so much for taking the time and explaining it to us. Anytime. Thanks for covering this important issue. Speaking of China, they banned all cur- uh, cryptocurrency transactions in their country today. They've been cracking down on cryptocurrency for a while, but this is just another sign of what, uh, what it means to have a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Um, it is, authoritarian governments know it's bad for them. They want to stop it in any way that they can. Now, they can't stop Bitcoin, but they can pressure other countries to block foreign exchanges and things like that. Uh, China's going to be a tough, tough, uh, tough road to hoe for, for people who like cryptocurrency there. They've kicked out all the miners already, so we'll see how that goes going forward. Um, also, um, Chris Cuomo is in trouble. He has a little piece in the New York Times, and you never want this piece to be written about you if your name is Chris Cuomo. It's entitled, Chris Cuomo Sexually Harassed Me. I hope he'll use his power to make change. Now, Cuomo, of course, was advising his brother on how to handle uh, the allegations of sexual harassment against him. That didn't work out so well. He's no longer governor. Um, But, uh, you know, that was already a terrible, terrible situation. And he did a lot of things wrong there. Not that CNN cares at all. Um, But these allegations can be tough to know. Are they true? Did she take something the wrong way? The allegation is basically he came in, gave her a hug and grabbed her butt when he came in right in front of her husband. And is that true? Well, yes, it is true. How do we know? Chris Cuomo emailed about it right after the incident. He said in his subject, now that I think of it, I am ashamed. Though my hearty greeting was a function of being glad to see you, Christian Slater got arrested for a kind of similar act, though born of an alleged negative intent, unlike my own. And as a husband, I can empathize with not liking to see my wife patted as such. So pass along my apology to your very good and noble husband, and I apologize to you as well for even putting you in such a position. Next time, I will remember the lesson, no matter how happy I am to see you. Chris Cuomo said, well, look, it wasn't sexual, so she shouldn't be, you know, don't worry about it. I won't do it again, I promise. And of course, is that going to be good enough for CNN? Probably. Why? Because they don't care what Chris Cuomo does. He could murder 14 kindergartners on his program on live television. They'd clean up the blood and go to commercial break. That's where we are with Chris Cuomo and CNN at this point. Back in a second. If you're not following me on Facebook, why not? Do it now. Click the follow button and hold it down on your phone. Uh, You can uh, can see and mark me as one of your favorites if you do that. And that's important to defeat the evil tech robots that are stopping you from seeing our content. Don't miss a second of this amazingly stupid show. We got a comment from Facebook. I think the reason many conservatives just want to dunk on liberals is because usually that's the approach liberals initiate with conservatives. Very true. Sort of the uh, we didn't start the fire defense. I mean, it was always burning since the world's been turning. And that's that's true. OK, so here's what happened. Chris Pratt has got a new movie coming out. This movie is he's going he's going to be voicing Mario in the Super Mario Brothers movie, which is great. You'd think Chris Pratt's awesome. I like Chris Pratt. However, Chris Pratt, we've done an investigation on this program. Chris Pratt, not Italian. I'm not even a plumber as far as I know, but definitely not Italian. Um, And that's the thing. The the woman playing uh, Princess Peach is white, so she can play that princess. Um, Charlie Day uh, from Zola Sunny in Philadelphia, he's playing Luigi. Uh, He is Italian. Uh, partially, so he can do that. However, uh, Jack Black, who's playing Bowser, 
is Jewish and not a mutated lizard. So controversy, cancel Black uh, Jack Black, and uh, we'll get that done and see you on Monday.